Hello, everybody. Hi. I'm Alex. Thank you for coming today to Filey Books, your local independent bookseller. Um, your attendance and book purchases let us keep having events like this one. Um, also, we are either one copy from selling out or we are sold out of the book. So um, if anyone didn't get a copy yet, uh, maybe you'll have one today or maybe you'll have one and you can place an order and we'll, we'll get that signed for you. Um, this evening, we have the pleasure of hearing from Ryan E. Emanuel about his new book, On the Swamp, Fighting for Indigenous Environmental Justice with Dr. Louis Rivers III. Ryan E. Emanuel Lumby is Associate Professor of Hydrology at, Uni at Duke University. EPA researcher Dr. Louis Rivers III works on furthering the integration of social scientists into EP the EPA's Office of Research and Development. Hi. Thank you again. Um, and hope you enjoy the event. Okay, that's working. Uh, thank y'all for coming. I'm not going to talk a lot because we want to hear from Ryan. Um, I'll do a brief introduction and get things started. I was Ryan's uh, wall mate, or not yeah. office mate. We, we were next to each other in C State. And, um, when I got there, Ryan was super welcoming. He was already there and we became friends. I feel honored and privileged to know Ryan for the last eight, nine, four minute. Um, <laughs> he's an amazing scholar, but I think more importantly, he's a really kind and genuine human being. And I think that comes through through a book, which is um, really a treat to read. It is uh, talks about the history of environmental justice in North Carolina about his Lumbee roots. And it's also a story about Ryan. It's a story about North Carolina. And it's a story about, you know, our fight for justice. So I think there's a lot in this book for everybody. So um, we'll go ahead and get things started. I was gonna ask Ryan, can you tell us a little bit about how you got to this point? Kind of like your um, your formative journey to get where you are now. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> maybe, maybe. The green light is on, but I don't think anything's coming out. It keeps on cutting off here. Oh, I think this one works. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Louis, really, thanks for that kind introduction. And thank you all for coming. I'm really excited to be here with you all this evening. Um, you know, I saved this for the end of the book, but I do say a little bit about my, my journey and how important specifically education was. Um, I grew up in uh, Charlotte Mecklenburg schools. So even though Robinson County is my home, um, it's always home. Um, my family lived in Charlotte two hours away. So if you're familiar with sort of the south central part of North Carolina, Highway 74 was sort of like an umbilical cord for my family that kept us attached to Robinson County. And we would burn up that highway um, at least one weekend a month traveling down to Robinson to visit my grandmother, aunts, uncles, cousins, um, everybody. And when I was in Charlotte, I was part of uh, an expatriate Lumbee community there. There's a large native uh, community in Charlotte, mostly Lumbee, other tribal nations represented as well. Um, a few years before I was born, that community came together and um, petitioned to create um, a, a program for um, uh, indigenous children who enrolled in public schools. And it was a newly offered program for the Department of Education called Indian Education. And it was meant to uh, meet the unique cultural and academic needs of uh, native students who are growing up outside of their homelands um, and also students who were um, isolated in, in school districts. So you know, my entire education, I was, I was always the only native student in, in my class and you know, usually one of two or three or maybe a handful in the entire school. And so the thing that helped us create community uh, was this program. And the rock of that program was a coordinator, Ms. Rosa Winfrey. So a long time uh, Lumbee educator uh, who, after a long teaching career, became the, the, um, the, the coordinator of this program. And so she would 
she would come around to our schools maybe once a year because she had a large circuit of schools that she had to visit. Uh, but Ms. Rosa would show up once a year and she would come into the classroom and you know, she would give a presentation about indigenous peoples of North Carolina. And that was, I, I knew everything that she said. But, <laughs> you know, in a way it felt, for a child, it felt validating, right? Mm -hmm. To have um, someone in a position of authority come in and, and talk to your classmates about who you are, where you come from, and it's so, it was sort of the opposite of the kind of othering um, that that I experienced through school. So I came through school at a time when literally like the demographic data that we filled out all the time, it said black, white, or other. And so like for probably the first five years of school, I was I was literally an other. And so Ms. Rosa, you know, came around and really helped to make sure that we were grounded in ways that complemented um, what we learned in our homes and in our families and our communities and help to extend that community into our schools. Um, and you know, she and many other educators and elders in my life, I think really influenced my path and kind of led me to where I am today as an educator. Okay, I think this works. <laughs> All right, yeah, thanks, Ryan. That that story, when I read it, it really struck me because I think a lot of people of color have that similar experience where you like you go through this primary education, you have this kind of history that's very much like a white centered history, and like any you know, Black History Month for me, like yeah, again, like I knew all this stuff, but like okay, we're going to talk about Black History for a month, and like this is real for my other classmates. I'm not out here just making stuff up about my history. So like that story really resonate with me and like I think a lot of things in this book are going to resonate with a lot of readers and I, I'm not sure if you wrote it that way but I feel like you know it really resonates with a lot of people um speaking of like your kind of educational journey one of the things that um I found interesting was this your kind of first encounter with land acknowledgments and like that whole process and before we um get there and that you kind of talk about that I want to just do a brief reading from the book, because there's like a, as the young people say, it's a bar. <laughs> um, whatever the intentions behind land acknowledgments, I am intrigued that otherwise well-educated listeners, especially university audiences, require continuous reminders that they occupy stolen land. Settler colonialism not only erases, it feeds on its own forgetfulness. Thanks for sharing that. I was I was reluctant to pick something to read, but I'm glad that you picked that particular um, excerpt. Yeah, and it does puzzle me, right, that we have to perform this this statement um, over and over again. Uh, but you know, the the critiques of land acknowledgments go deeper than that, um, and there's an entire movement that some of you are familiar with, uh, the land back uh, movement, that actually calls on people to put action behind. Um, these kinds of statements but yeah the you know the first chapter of the book is sort of a, a reimagining of what land acknowledgments could be if we actually took them seriously and in that sense it's not something that you can do on the stage for a few seconds before you get down to the business of why you're there for the, the event it, it is the event and more than that it's probably going to take a few days um, to work through and so I imagine the introduction to this book as sort of a, a land acknowledgement for the place that I come from. If we're gonna be serious about the words that we're using um, to, to talk about indigenous land tenure, let's unpack that some more, go into the history. Um, and I know that a lot of that material is historical, but at the same time, it's still living memory um, for me and for my elders, um, it's it's not really that long ago. Mm. Yeah, it, what you just something you said there struck a chord. This idea of like it's not that long ago because I think so often we a lot of people do treat it like it was that long ago. But like, can you talk a little bit more about that? Like how this is like through you know your connection with your community with your elders that like this isn't like ancient history. Yeah, I mean, I am the first generation to not go to segregated schools. And you know, as many of you in this room 
um, have experienced that as well, right? So like, I, I grew up with my parents telling me what it was like um, to be in a, in Robinson County, we had a bizarre tri-apartheid system, right? Where there were three racialized versions of, it, of everything in society. Um, yeah, and that was you know, one generation back. And one interesting tidbit that I found, and this is in the footnotes of the uh, natural gas chapter. And so I think it illustrates this idea of not that long ago. So I, I was really curious in researching and writing this book about the history of natural gas pipeline infrastructure in North Carolina. I learned that the first pipelines to the eastern part of the state were built in the late 1950s. And there's a whole series of newspaper articles that kind of walk through the, the history of um, planning and advertising and marketing for these pipeline projects. But in that reporting, I found the name of the, um, the, the, the engineering uh, professional, the technical professional that the corporation hired um, to come in and design and oversee the construction of this pipeline project. And uh, this guy had worked, interestingly, as a side note, he had worked on um, Cancer Alley. So he was one of the engineers that planned out um, this, this massive industrialized zone along the lower Mississippi River. And then he was hired away to North Carolina uh, where he worked on our pipeline infrastructure. But anyway, his father, this was late 1950s that all of this is happening. This gentleman's father um, was a Civil War veteran. <laughs> Uh, and a, a sugar plantation owner from Louisiana, which is just bizarre. And it, and it serves to compress our idea that this was a long time ago, right? Because there were people planning industrial polluting infrastructure in Eastern North Carolina whose parents literally fought in the Civil War um, you know, just a generation ago. So yeah, it's literally not that long ago. And I think that's important when you think about things like environmental justice, because so many of the patterns that we see today, and you know this better than I do, are, are the result of decisions that were made in decades past. And we have to live with the legacy of those decisions um, right here in the 2020s. Yeah, I, I mean, this compression of history or like this kind of ahistorical way of thinking about the environment, it really does serve the exploitation of people in the environment. Like if we can make it, if we can create these disconnects between our history, it makes these makes it much easier to exploit what's going on. I think that was one of the things that drove me to a historical analysis in the first place. Because when in the in the first years of working on environmental justice as a scholar, when you and I were first getting to know each other, um, I was really frustrated by what I heard from people who were developing, in this case, the failed Atlantic Coast Pipeline. When you ask, why, why are you putting the infrastructure in this particular place? And that particular place was the Lumbee Community of Prospect. And the only answer is because this is where our other stuff is, full stop. And that was an acceptable answer, apparently, in the, in the regulatory world, and nobody Nobody peeks behind that to see, well, why is your stuff here in the first place? Yeah, this is like just talking to Ryan over lunch or something because there's so many tangents I'm thinking about. Like um, in this regulatory world where you're talking about, not only is it like, you know, you kind of don't think about history, but there's no place for like culture. And there, like, we, can you talk a little bit about like how does history or how does culture come into this regulatory process or doesn't come into the regulatory process? Yeah, that, that's a really good point. So, you know, it shows up in a very insulated way. And the example I'll give you is um, environmental impact statements. These are long regulatory documents. It could be hundreds or thousands of pages long, right? That, that's the, it's the official technical record of um, all of the potential impacts and and ostensibly all the externalities that are associated um, with a particular project, right? And that's the document that the uh, regulators use to, to decide whether or not to authorize something. 
Um, there, there is a section for cultural impacts, and they're limited to that particular section, um, and they're walled off from all types of environmental impacts, from economic impacts, and we know, and everybody here knows that that's, that's not how, how cultural impacts show up in the world, right? Really all of these things intertwine, and if you compartmentalize cultural impacts from socioeconomic impacts, from water impacts, you know, you're really taking a reductionist approach to environmental regulation um, that, that really serves the interests of people who want to dismiss things like cultural impacts altogether. Yeah, th this theme of reductionism is something that comes up throughout the entire book, because I think that's an important tool, again, for systems of oppression or for exploiting people is like, reducing or reducing, you know, reducing them. And like thinking about that, I want to ask you if you could share us a little bit about this, um, what is this dude's official name? John Lawson's travel log. If you could tell us a little bit about that. Uh, this is a, this is a North Carolina audience. So raise your hand if you know who John Lawson is. Here, a lot of folks know who John Lawson is, right? He's commonly described as um, an, an early English explorer um, who documented the flora and fauna and, and people of colonial North Carolina, right? So uh, in reality, it was his, his first trip out of the British Isles, um, wealthy young guy who wanted to have an adventure and make his fortune. So sailed to Charleston, South Carolina and recruited um, indigenous folks to take him on a a tour of what he thought was the wild backcountry, but in reality was just home for the folks who were taking him on the tour. And he, he wrote a travel log. And his travel log is um, I mean it's a it's a standard reference that many of us encounter in our education and just social life in North Carolina. Right. And I want to give credit, like he he made some really interesting observations and recorded some details that would be lost to history if he hadn't written them down. But his writings are also infused with um, tremendous racism and ideas of extraction, extractivism. How do we exploit this land? Um, how do we enslave and exploit the people who live here? Um, that, that's what his eye was for. And so despite all these really great observations that he made, you also have to filter through um, what you know is coming. And so he's really the, the, the vanguard um, of, of the, the colonial exploitation of what's now North Carolina. Yeah, so I, I find it really frustrating that, you know, here we have some, some kind of cool observations. He, he tells some really interesting stories about um, uh, uh, indigenous ceremonies in Eastern North Carolina at the, at the opening of the 18th century. And there are amazing stories about uh, the supernatural world. And then he stops and says, dear reader, I'm sorry that you have to suffer through this. I'm only telling you this so you can get an idea of the utter ridiculous things that these people believe. And so <laughs> everything is tempered um, through, yeah, through, through his lens. Yeah, I mean, that really resonated with me. That's one of the parts that resonate with me. And like, originally, you know, I was gonna, originally it made me think about like, this is a really a critique of like, I think a lot of times like the history of black people in the United States has been told through like this white lens and this other lens. And like, I would love to hear about like just day to day interactions of people, but like, you don't hear that. You hear like, you know, about the worst parts of the history or very like, you know, bastardized parts of the history. But I think also in your book, to bring it a little bit closer to home, I think it could be a critique of what we sometimes do in the social sciences. And like when we go into communities and like we claim to be, you know, unbiased observers and we do like this observational research, which is like kind of a cornerstone of a lot of social sciences. But like, as I get older, I realize it's incredibly problematic to think about it, it, that the story of Lawson just crystallized that for me. So like, uh, like, do you ever think about, I mean, you're great at doing interdisciplinary co collaborations, but do you ever think about like, you know, some 
you ever look at like some of the trends in other disciplines and you're like, I don't think you should be doing that or like, I don't want to put you on the spot. <laughs> yeah, so here, here's what I'm thinking. Like, yes, I love interdisciplinary work, but I also want to be very cautious about leveling criticisms um, far afield from where I'm trained because you know, I always worry that I'm I'm reading the room wrong. And you and I have had these conversations where I have to ask you, is this really the way it is? <laughs> and more often than not, you will say, yes, this is the way the way that it is. Um, but I'm not, when it comes down to it, I'm not an anthropologist, I'm not a sociologist. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it would probably be unfair for me to level, <laughs> level, critiques at those fields, but I mean, the way that you describe um, those methods and that type of work, um, yeah, I mean, it does remind me of the things that I've seen in Lawson's writing and in other, other colonial uh, figures who came before and after him. Yeah, this critique is not coming from Ryan, it's my critique. So <laughs> I will say I don't like anthropology. So that is my critique, no offense to anyone in the audience. So I don't want to put those words in Ryan's mouth. My wife is shaking her head. <laughs> this is every day with my husband. <laughs> um, building on this idea of like, because I think you're right, I like how you say that like loss and kind of sets a template yeah. for like exploitation, but just like, what we even see today when we talk about indigenous people in the United States is like this really kind of like homogeneous kind of mythic but reductionist approach. Can you talk about like, um, there's a part of this book where you talk about the Lombiac, which I found fascinating, which is kind of like a door opening into like the heterogeneity and indigenous folks and like just adding complexity, you know, complexity to how we think about indigenous people in the U.S. Yeah, and the reality is that we flatten the stories of indigenous peoples, like we flatten so many complicated stories, right? And the Lumbee Act is a really great example of that. Like one of the one of the ways that we flatten indigenous stories is to say, oh, we can put everybody into a couple of different bins. You've got federally recognized tribes and non-federally recognized tribes. And the Lumbee Act flies in the face of that. So for those of you that don't know, in 1956, um, Congress passed um, a, a bill that recognized Lumbee people as, um, as American Indians, and then the exact same bill uh, prohibited us from having a government-to-government -government relationship with the United States. And so as a result, um, Lumbees are usually treated as non federally recognized um, indigenous people for the purposes of um, most legal statutes. So, for example, the um, Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, um, we're excluded from that. We're excluded from the National Historic Preservation Act, which is the law that requires consultation with tribal nations prior to um, uh, environmental permitting and things like the Dakota Access Pipeline. Um, the legal challenges around that centered on Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act, right? And so at the same time, we get to participate in federally funded programs like Indian education, right? And there are other venues where um, we, we do look more like federally recognized American Indians. And so just our story alone is sort of the, the example that, that blows up that, that simplified dichotomy. Um, I see Danielle shaking her head because she is our, our expert on, on these kinds of policies, right? Um, yeah, but our story is a complicated one, but the point is it's not the only complicated one, right? You have lots of tribal communities um, whose, um, whose situations are singularly unique in the way that you know, perhaps our, our legal standing is singularly unique. And then North Carolina is extra special because we have indigenous groups that have no recognition status whatsoever, right? And sometimes we even find ourselves engaging in, in lateral violence um, with, with those communities. And so it's a, it's a really um, complicated situation to say the least.
and we don't do it justice in our in our public discourse and so one of the things i wanted to accomplish with this book was to show the complexity of these issues for north carolina because if i can demonstrate it here in this one small area that i come from imagine how complicated it is for the rest of the united states or for indigenous peoples globally That's my son being loud. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, uh, and that kind of builds on like, it's like one of those, another legacy of colonialism that comes up. It's like, you know, I'm, I'm, it's a really well written book. You'll enjoy reading the book. But like, that's another theme that kind of goes throughout this book is just like this subtle legacy, or not so subtle, legacy of colonialism coming through the book. So like, I didn't. <laughs> pre-game this with you before, sorry. But like, you know, like, so you're trained as like a hydrologist and this is like, no offense to hydrology, but this is way more interesting <laughs> than anything you would expect to read from like a hydrologist. So like, I, I, I'm amazed at like the scholar that you are. You know, like it's so rare to find someone who has like, like he's a hydrologist, but like, he's like a hydrologist rock star, <laughs> you know? <laughs> He's like good at doing hydrology, but also like you're good at history. You're good at weaving these together. So like, how did you get to this place? Cause it's really impressive to see a scholar really develop this type of, you know, body of work and way of seeing the world. Well, thanks for that, Louie. But I'm, I'm gonna push back a little bit and say that I might be fairly representative of indigenous scholars and other minoritized scholars because not only the reality is not only do we have to be experts in what we're supposed to be experts at and what we're trained to be experts at but we also have to be trained in history and law and public policy and all of these other areas because we have to be ready at a moment's notice to pull out a, a lecture to justify our existence um, or to clarify some misconception or myth. Um, and all of that has to happen before we can actually talk about whatever the business was we were there to talk about in the first place. And so it's this, um, I guess you call it like overhead that you have to, you have to carry around and, and be ready to be ready to account for at a moment's notice. And I don't think that I'm unique in, in having the ability to do that. Um, I can think of lots of examples, including folks in this room who, who have to do that um, all the time. And so, yeah, that's, that's what I think about that. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I think I definitely see that in the academy, but I think maybe that doesn't get recognized the way it should. And it's good to see when it is recognized in the academy. Like, you know, this book is a form of recognition or just like realizing that this is a really important voice. Yeah, thanks for that. And it, yeah, it's important to note it, to note that like most of the people that I'm thinking about are not gonna have the, the time or the privilege to, to write a book or to do something like this, right? And I, I just happen to, to, I, to, to have that privilege as a tenured faculty member um, to be able to, to produce this book. But there are lots of other people who have you know, similar narratives that they're carrying around inside their heads um, and you know, unfortunately are not gonna have the space um, to do something like this. So I'm really grateful um, that, that I was in a position to write this. But I also wanna acknowledge that um, there are lots of amazing stories and narratives that are out there. I, I want to stick to our schedule, so <laughs> make sure, because I'm sure people in the audience have questions and reactions. So maybe you start to think about closing this part of like our discussion. If you could talk about the Great Kohari River. And like I was saying to you before, I think this is really an example of like kind of revolutionary reclamation of like of land, of history, and like a provision of hope. So like, I just find this is super, it's an uplifting story. Yeah, um, the Great Kohari River Project 
is an amazing story and I was so eager to end the case studies of the book. So the middle section of the book is sort of this series of um, case studies, but I, I knew from the beginning I wanted to finish out those with the story of the Great Coherie River, which for those of you that don't know, uh, the Great Coherie River flows through Sampson County, North Carolina, which constantly vies with Robinson County for the honor of being the largest county in North Carolina. Um, and it's home of Coherie people. And I want to um, acknowledge that, that um, even though I'm Lumbee, um, my family, my Emanuel family, comes from the Coherie community. Emanuel's a Coherie surname. And so that's um that's my people as well and you know over the course of 10 or 12 years um, the great coherry river project has managed to demonstrate a type of ecological restoration um, that i've never seen before and so the short story which is told in full in the book um, is that over a couple of generations um, Coherie people lost their day-to-day -day access to the river um, through a chain of events that had to do with um, uh, land ownership and conservation and things like this. Ostensibly, um, good things like conserving wetlands uh, had unintended consequences of um, separating Coherie people from their ancestral river. Um, and a, a good friend and elder of mine, Mr. Philip Bell, um, decided that 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 was not going to um, that was not going to last, and so um, he led an effort to get people back on the water. It started with um, clearing debris, clearing snags, clearing down trees, so that people could navigate the river in canoes and kayaks. Right, because over time, um, hurricane damage and just it, just regular periodic floods had filled the river with all kinds of debris. Uh, the floodplain was relatively inaccessible in that it was hard to walk down to the river and actually reach the water, including reaching many of the places that are historically and culturally important um, to the community. And so, uh, it really just started as people in the water clearing out, um, you know, clearing out wood and trying to make it navigable because my understanding and what I've observed in the community is that a healthy river is one where people are interacting with it on a day-to-day -day basis. It's not the model of ecosystem restoration where you plant, re-sculpt, do all this stuff, and then it's hands off for 50 years. That's not the model that I observed um, in the Kohari community. It was, we need to be on this river and, and we need to be on it as a community um, and it needs to be on a regular basis. And so um, another friend and elder, Mr. Greg Jacobs always says that you know, for generations, the river took care of us and now we need to take care of the river. And what he meant by that was uh, similar to the Lumbee experience during Jim Crow segregation um, when Coherie people were excluded from all aspects of, um, of social life in Sampson County, the river was a place for recreation, um, a place for community gatherings, um, and so it really took care of the community and, and nurtured generations of Coherie people, right? It was a source of food, a uh, source of solace and so taking care of the river involves um, making sure that people are back on the river and appreciating it um, as a as a, a, a beautiful amazing black water stream but also as a place that is extremely important um, to the history and the present day culture of Kohari people and today that that river cleanup effort has evolved and now hundreds more than 100 miles of river have been cleaned out in Sampson County. Um, the tribe has an ecotourism business that is, is booked to way out with taking people down the river um, and giving them a, a culturally informed experience 
um, on the water and it's just amazing and so that is uh that is a project that started out um you know with no funding no authorization from any authorities <laughs> right um but now if you you can go out and look at um in North Carolina conservation websites and organizations and this project is it's like the, the darling of all of these uh, uh, conservation groups in the region right but they it didn't start out that way um, but I think people are coming around to seeing how powerful a model this is of restoring an ecosystem and really what they're doing is they're not just interested in ecological restoration, they're interested in restoring the relationship between people and the river. And I think that's what restoration means in this particular case. Yeah, um, I just know that said to be that, that would be the last thing, but can you follow up a little bit more on this idea of like, and you alluded to this in the story, this idea of like, um, I always say John Muir versus Pinchot, but that's not even right. But like this idea of like conservation where we see like nature as this kind of pristine, untouched area versus like this really seeing nature and humans as like something that we're oh, yeah, but, Yeah, so the myth of wilderness, right? And we, we observe this myth in the way that we curate national parks and wilderness areas, right? But the North American continent is 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 not not a wilderness um, to the, the first peoples of this place right in fact there's uh, many examples of of hard work that people did to um, to create the kind of landscapes that that um, settlers observed when they got here right and here in this region it was it was fire indigenous peoples burned um, extensively in order to have the kinds of um, forest land that that, um, that we thought was appropriate for uh, fostering wildlife, edible uh, plants, um, travel, things like this. Like I I look out the forest in my neighborhood every day, and I wave my hands and I imagine just burning all the under undergrowth. <laughs> I want to bring fire back, right? But the you know the idea that that there's a pristine wilderness that's untouched by humans is a that's a colonial myth, mm -hmm. right? And it's it's on display in North Carolina still. And I think in the introduction or even the preface of the book, there's a quote from the the guy who was president of Wake Forest College in the 19th century that waxes poetic about how North Carolina is this amazing place because. There's no evidence that any people were here before <laughs> settlers. And he, you know, he goes on and gives, it's a graduation speech from the, uh, from, from the mid 1800s at Wake Forest. And of course, this is the, um, um, this is, this is the peak of Manifest Destiny. Um, so he's just, he's just echoing the spirit of that time. But that was the first time I had encountered a North Carolina flavored Manifest <laughs> Destiny. And so, that's why I included it, because the whole book is intended to be sort of North Carolina flavored take on the good and the bad um, of our experience here. Well, thank you. I want to respect, you know, provide time for the audience with our last 20 minutes to answer questions. But thank you for asking me to do this. I got the email from Ryan up. I felt incredibly honored. And like I said, yes, even before consulting with my wife. So like, um, thank you, and it's always good to see you. Thanks, Louie. Thanks, Whitney. <laughs> um, yeah, I'd love to. Uh, you know, I can put the microphone. I can. I can facilitate. I can take okay. the microphone out. And it's already on. Well, I grew up one mile from, Lum we call it the Lumbee River, but the lumber part is in interesting to me because it is also called the Lumber River. And I remember as a very small child, like maybe age four, seeing these barges come down one of the landings with this lumber on it. So could you kind of 
talk about the difference in the Lumber River and the Lumbee yeah. River. So first of all, to clarify, it is the same river, right? <laughs> and the, the history of the adoption of the name Lumber for the river is something that I talk about in the book, but the short story is it was an aspirational name. Um, a group of uh, settlers from that region wanted to uh, clear cut the swamps and dredge the river so that it would be commercially navigable. And this was in the first decade of the 1800s. And at that time, North Carolina did public works through lotteries. And so this was a common thing in early U.S. Uh, this group of, of settler businessmen went to the general went to the state government and said we'd like a, we'd like a charter to have a lottery to do this they said well where are you going to do it and they said it's this place down here called drowning creek and they said yo you're never going to sell any lottery tickets uh, to develop a place called drowning creek you got to come up with a better name and so they they said oh well we we want to develop a timber industry here so we're going to call it the lumber river um, that's my that's my read of the, the legislative records from North Carolina um, and the reality was they, they still didn't sell any lottery tickets and they had to give the charter back after a couple of years but because the, the name had been changed by the state legislature it stuck and so from the first decade of the 1800s um, it's officially been the Lumber River and uh, 200 years later, uh, almost to the year, the Lumbee Tribal Council passed an ordinance um, uh, calling on everybody to refer to the river by uh, what our tribal government um, believes is the ancestral name of the river. And there's, there's questions about like exactly how far back the word Lumbee goes, but the reason I use that term and why um, I prefer it over lumber is because it is, it's a self-determined um, term. You know, we, we decided for ourselves that's what we wanted to call the river. And on that matter, I'm going to defer to our, to our tribal council. And so by using the name Lumbee in my writing, um, I really want to model what it looks like um, to, to, to actually respect um, the expertise and the decision-making authority of a sovereign tribal government. And so I've had to do this not just in the book, but also in scientific articles that I've written in the past. Um, we've had to put footnotes in those articles, which is not common in, in our style of writing, but I had to put footnote that says, you know, the reason why I'm gonna to refer to this river as Lumbee instead of Lumber for the entire paper is because in 2009, the tribal council passed this ordinance, blah, blah, blah. But I think that's it's a very important to me. It's a very important um, distinction to make. That's the Lumbee River to me. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Is that the cover? Is that the Lumbee River? That is the Lumbee River. Yeah, and that's a that's a cell phone uh, photo <laughs> that I took um, in my canoe and the people at UNC Press uh, made it look amazing. <laughs> Ryan, uh, I'm wondering if you can talk more about the influence of your family and your tribal people in your education, as opposed to the economic Western education that we all have here. Um, and talk a little bit more about the importance of land and being part of the land rather than having dominion over it. Yeah, thanks for that. I will say I will start by saying it's complicated um, because you know, in many ways, like Lumbee people replicate systems of education that exist um, in mainstream society, and there I think that there are, there are some good aspects of that. But there are also some harmful aspects of that. In the Lumbee community in particular, um, we, we create educators and we have a long history of training um, K-12 
teachers as well as higher education instructors. And I, I believe if you were to go out and do a survey um, of indigenous educators in the United States, Lumbees might have a disproportionately large share of that group. And it stems from, from our history dealing with the state of North Carolina um, and, and trying to secure, basically secure rights to um, educational independence. But that legacy um, has led to a situation now where you know, there, are, there are a great many Lumbee teachers and even um, university faculty in a relative sense. Having said that, um, I do feel like I did get two educations, right? One of them was the schools that I attended in Charlotte, and my other education was having to go around all around Robinson County uh, with my parents and sit quietly while the grown-ups talked. And you know, this is, this is not exclusively an indigenous um, uh, phenomenon, right? Many of us might have grown up um, in environments where you had to sit on the carpet or sit on the rug and, and listen to the grown-ups talk and, and you, you, you weren't supposed to, to interact. But in doing so, you, know, you absorb the stories and you understand what the lived experiences were like um, for the generations that came before you. And in my case, many of those stories were about what it was like to spend time on the river what it was like to spend time in the fields, right? Because we're also agricultural people. Um, you know, what it was like to experience segregation firsthand and all of these other things. So I think I, I am grateful to my parents for making me do that. Although the young Ryan uh, was, was very antsy. <laughs> Excuse me. One thing I find irritating, there's highways called the, called the Indians. Now, I thought Indians came from India, and it, uh, it, it's irritating to, to hear. So what is the, have, what's your take on it? So I said I wasn't going to read anything, but <laughs> I think I do want to read something, if you don't mind. I have a note in the beginning of the book that's a note on terminology and I wasn't sure exactly where it fit in so I tried to insert it here. So I say for stylistic reasons I use multiple terms to refer to the original peoples of the place now known as North Carolina. These terms include indigenous peoples, native peoples, Native Americans, and American Indians. For what it's worth, there's no consensus, scholarly or otherwise, that any particular term is preferred by indigenous peoples in North Carolina, within any region of the United States, or within the U.S. as a whole. There's not even a consensus on whether or not a consensus exists. <laughs> so some folks will insist otherwise. However, if you're non-indigenous reader seeking guidance on appropriate terminology, my advice is always to read the room and defer to any indigenous peoples present. And if you're in a room where discussions of indigenous peoples are happening, but no indigenous peoples are present, ask yourself why that is. <laughs> but the, I think the, the short answer is that it, it can be generational. And so it is an appropriate term um, to some folks, um, but other people might find that offensive. And in the end, it's complicated, right? Because some people have, have grown up with that term and they embrace it. I, I, I did a disservice because I didn't give you a chance to talk about this this concept, this idea of indigenous environmental justice. So, like, if you want to talk a little bit about this idea, which is you know throughout the whole book, but I didn't give you a chance to really discuss it in our previous conversation. Yeah. So there's a. Columbia education scholar Brian Brayboy has talked about the importance of, of the lenses that we use, particularly indigenous lenses, um, to examine the world around us. And one of the mechanisms by which we do that and by which we theorize is to tell stories. Um, so 
to me, one of the mechanisms for conveying um, ideas around indigenous environmental justice is to do it through storytelling. But that idea is, is to take the general concept of environmental justice, which we define in lots of different ways, but you know, the EPA might say the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people in environmental decision making. Okay, so what does that look like from the standpoint of specific indigenous peoples? And to me, that's indigenous environmental justice is just that. And so it's, it's grounded and localized um, with a particular community, given how singularly unique um, every tribal nation is. And so in our case, it's, it's this uh, North Carolina experience that is particularly Lumbee, but shares a lot in common with our, uh, with our neighboring tribes. And so when I, when I think of indigenous environmental justice as in the title of the book, I'm thinking about that particular lens um, that encapsulates our lived experiences, um, our unique struggles to have our inherent sovereignty recognized, um, and the ways that we think about self-determination, the ways that we think about adjacent ideas to environmental justice, like free prior and informed consent, which I guess is not even adjacent, that is kind of central within the principles of environmental justice that were laid out in the 1990s. Um, yeah, so that's, that's how I would think about indigenous environmental justice. But I really like um, Brian Brayboy's idea that um, stories um, are, are useful for conveying complicated ideas. And we discount that in Western academics, right? And I got in trouble several years ago when I said something like scientific papers are just uh, narratives. And people stared at me and said, what? I said, yeah, we, 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 we all agree to a common narrative arc. What do you mean? Introduction, methods, results, analysis, and discussion. That's a narrative. We don't, you don't do your research in exactly that order, right? And so, but it, it's just another kind of storytelling. And stories can be true, and that's a good illustration of, of how they can convey knowledge. I think we have time for one more question. If y'all don't ask, I will. <laughs> oh. Oh, oh, okay. I'm curious about the Lundi language, the language that you and your parents and grandparents spoke and then historically what was spoken uh, by your ancestors. Yeah, thanks for that. So for at least 300 years, we've spoken the English. And I have a, a what I think is a really funny story um, in the book about um, an indigenous man in Eastern North Carolina in 1703 who cussed out a settler. Um, <laughs> And then when the settler said he was gonna tell the magistrate about it, he said, well, you can tell the magistrate to kiss my arse. <laughs> and this was all in English, right? So we've been speaking English for a very long time. We've been cussing people out in English for a long time. Uh, you know, Lumbees developed a, a unique dialect of English in that time period. Because we are um, an amalgamation of colonial era indigenous peoples, our ancestors spoke um, several different languages. Uh, Sheral, uh, Tuscarora, some of the Carolina Algonquian um, languages along the coast. Um, because of the violent upheavals that followed that, that period in the early, very early 1700s, um, our societies were, were wrecked during that period. Um, displaced, refugees, um, orphaned. Um, and as a result, the, the people who came together in places like Robinson County um, adopted the language that everybody around them was speaking, which was English. And so that is why for centuries um, we spoke in English. And you know, one of the, I mean, to me personally, like one of the greatest tragedies is 
not having the continuity of our language that many indigenous peoples have. But I will say that many people who still have their languages do not have the length of exposure to colonialism that we have had. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it is a, that is a gnawing issue in our communities, even as language revitalization efforts um, are taking place. Um, just the fact that there's a discontinuity there, um, I think is really traumatic. So thanks for that. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering, um, since this book was full of really important historical accounts and your analysis of it, I'm also wondering what you think the impact of this book or the stories in it, how it's transferred and um, shared with youth, hum the Lumbee and Kohari youth, and how that might impact um, North Carolina's and in coastal indigenous like self-determination and how to, how this might be carried on by, by indigenous youth? You know, that is a specific um, demographic that I had in mind when I was writing this because especially in the past 10 years, we, we've had a lot of writing and analysis and books and journalism on indigenous environmental struggles, but very little of that work um, reflects our experiences in North Carolina that come out of our our weird and and troubling um, colonial experience. And so I wanted young people from Lumbee, Kohari, even Hawasaponi, Waccamaw Suwan um, tribes to be able to see their stories situated in the larger constellation of environmental struggles generally, but also indigenous environmental struggles. And my hope is that once they connect the dots in that constellation, um, they'll be able to see the bigger picture and take it with them as they go on to do whatever it is they're going to do. And they won't have to, they won't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, you know, and they'll know that there's a larger, there's a larger framework that they fit into troubling as that framework is, um, that they're not alone in the struggles that, that their communities have. Can I make just a quick, um, it's really quick and, and on topic as I'm usually not. I'll just, um, I'll just add to your point about cultural continuity and language as a, another Lumbee academic, sort of using the term academic loosely, um, I love the story about kissing my arse, uh, and I think that like while we don't have the language continuity, I was on the news while we were sitting in this room for telling the university essentially to kiss my arse, and um, you'll hear more of it, right? Like we're still, yeah, we're still giving them the business. I will say that, so someone I, I reference a lot in the book, thank you for that, Larry. I really appreciate you. Uh, Vine Deloria Jr spent a lot of time with Lumbee people um, in his career, you know, and he made observations about us as another indigenous person visiting from you know, tribal nation in the Great Plains. And you know, he, he observed these other aspects of cultural continuity that were not linguistic. And one of those was our, our well, I'll say our attitude um, towards, towards the world around us. But yeah, I mean, there are absolutely ways to have cultural continuity that are not um, language-based. One of the things that we do as Lumbee people is we start every conversation by trying to figure out how we are kin to each other, <laughs> right? And I did this in DC last week with a Lumbee who's based in Baltimore who I'd never met before in person and we are straight up fourth cousins <laughs> not and the amazing thing is we're not removed or anything we just counted back the generations and found our common ancestor and you know that is the idea of kinship and trying to establish your relationship to somebody else before you engage in 
conversation or business or things like that. That is uh, or, or go on a date. That's true. That's true. I've heard that that's another reason why Lumbee people um, are so good with their genealogies. Um, yeah, but that that is uh, that is an indigenous trait, and it's something that we've carried with us despite the loss of our some of our original languages. So thanks for that. I know we're at the end, but that makes me think about Lumbees have a special place in the environmental justice movement also. And it seems like that co cultural continuity has made you incredible allies for other oppressed peoples. Like, can you briefly speak on that? Because I think that's really an important part of this history here, especially in North Carolina. Yeah, so, you know, I'll, I'll point out a couple of things. Um, we have Lumbee representation at the um, the People of Color Environmental Leadership Summit that sketched out the 17 principles of environmental justice in the 1990s that led to the current federal policy on environmental justice. Like we have a Lumbee person at the table representing indigenous peoples. Uh, we also had a, a amazing um, multicultural movement in the early 1980s that resulted in the EPA suing North Carolina over stringent environmental regulations. This was over a, um, a waste disposal plant that was proposed um, within the Lumbee watershed and would have discharged uh, wastewater into the river. And uh, Lumbee people, black people, white people, came together um, and they not only protested that movement, um, grandmothers brought mason jars of Lumbee River water to the General Assembly in Raleigh and set them down in front of lawmakers and said, you know, this is our water. It was a water is life moment decades ago. Someone brought me a jar recently. One of those jars? Yeah. So they're still around. Right, and this was in the early 1980s, just a couple of years after the birth of the environmental justice movement in Warren County. Um, but as a result, North Carolina passed stringent regulations that frightened the federal government because they said if other states adopt similar regulations, there'll be nowhere to dispose of our toxic waste. <laughs> and so for that reason, the EPA had planned this to, um, um, had planned to pursue some kind of legal action um, with the state of North Carolina, but a lot of people were involved in that and have been involved in other movements as well and, and had these powerful allyships, just as Louie mentioned. And those, most of those are stories that are not in the book, but yeah, I encount I've encountered a lot of those. I've met a lot of people in that movement and they've mentored me and inspired me to think about um, environmental justice in, in new and interesting ways, at least for me. Thanks. Thank you all. And that's everything. <laughs> if anyone didn't get their book signed, though, I'm sure that Ryan yeah, would be happy to. Yeah, happy to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.